Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another video in Geography 340 Climatology. I'm Dr. Zach Illingendorf. Today, we're going to be talking about air parcels and lifting mechanisms. So we think of air oftentimes as these discrete packets or parcels uh, moving about the atmosphere in a certain way, driven by certain tendencies within the atmosphere. So we're going to be looking into those and talking about what drives air to move up, lift, if you will. So the different lifting mechanisms that we'll be looking at as well. I'm going to start off with some review. So how is air cooled to its dew point? Well, we talked about a couple of different possibilities in the last couple of videos on diabatic and adiabatic processes. So diabatic processes just refer to any temperature change of air that's not related to adiabatic vertical displacement. So vertical being the key word there. We're seeing this change in vertical movement of an air parcel. So diabatic processes are not related to that vertical movement. Adiabatic processes deal with the changing temperatures of a parcel of air due to the air rising or sinking adiabatically. Adiabatic processes assume no heat, mass, or momentum pass across the air parcel boundary. Rates of adiabatic change occur differently depending on whether or not that parcel of air is saturated or unsaturated. So we've talked about a few different lapse rates, if you will. We have our uh, elapse rate, in, sorry, in general, just elapse rate is uh, the rate of temperature change with height, typically in degrees Celsius or degrees per kilometer. Uh, so dry adiabatic lapse rate, or the DALR, is basically just an unsaturated parcel of air cooling or changing at a rate of one degree Celsius for every 100 meters of change. Uh, it warms at that rate and it cools at that rate as well. Moist adiabatic lapse rate, or MALR, uh, is that what happens when we have saturated air or saturated air parcel, so relative humidity is equal to 100%, that cools at a rate that varies from around 4 or 0.4 to 0.9 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters. And then we have our dew point lapse rate as well, or DPLR. So the dew point, uh, if we think back to 104, in geography 104, when we did the moisture in the atmosphere lab, we held dew point as a constant, but that's not really the case, as we often find when we kind of dive into the more uh, intricate and advanced details of things. So the dew point also cools at a rate of about 0.2 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters. So we need to make sure we take that into account when we're looking at things like orographic lifting and air being forced up and over a boundary. So that dew point is going to change just like your uh, moist and dry adiabatic lapse rates will as well. So what causes air to rise? Well, this one might be the most familiar as we kind of go back and, and harken back to our 104 again. So our primary lifting mechanisms, the first one we're going to talk about is orographic lifting. So this is the process in which mountains or highlands act as barriers to the flow of air and force the air to ascend. So the air cools adiabatically and clouds and precipitation may result. We see in this uh, graphic here, this airflow being forced up and over this mountain, and as it is moved upwards, we see those clouds forming kind of midway up the mountain. We see that here. Uh, this is on the east or west coast of California, uh, kind of the historic Route 1. So air coming in, kind of moist air coming in off the Pacific. As it rises, it cools. As it cools, it condenses. And as it condenses, you have cloud formation. That is our Lifting condensation level that we're looking at here, the base of those clouds uh, on the windward side of this topographic barrier. Here you can see a bit more intricate of a detail uh, figure. We kind of maybe remember something very similar to this in our uh, Mount Doom example. So we kind of see or assume in this case, our saturated adiabatic lapse rate is 0.6 degrees Celsius with every 100 meters. So we start at 20 degrees Celsius for our air temperature. Our dew point is 12 degrees. Those are both changing. Our lifting condensation level is around 1,000 meters in this example. As they rise, for every 100 meters, they rise after the lifting condensation level. Once air is fully saturated at 100% relative humidity, it's changing at 0.6 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters. As it rises up and over the crest, you see it kind of hangs on a little bit there towards the leeward edge of the crest. Uh, it starts to descend, and as it descends, the air parcel warms at the dry adiabatic lapse rate because we're no longer uh, equal, if you will. We're no longer, our dew point and our uh, air temperature are no longer equal, so we are no longer saturated. 
So the dew point is still changing at that 0.2 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters, but the air temperature is changing more drastically at that 1 degree Celsius per every 100 meters for the dry adiabatic lapse rate. What you end up with is a dry and warm parcel of air and potentially rain shadows on the leeward side of these topographic barriers. We can see here in this GIF uh, kind of exactly that happening. So you've got that air billowing over the crest of this uh, mountain chain and this, this sill here that we're looking at. And as it does so, it evaporates and dries as it uh, drops down. So we're looking at the leeward side here, you can see those clouds rolling over the top. So we're looking at, yeah, the leeward uh, side of these mountains as clouds are being forced up and over. You can see that here as well. And we can see just another vantage point from a different mountain chain, uh, kind of that same thing. We see those clouds being forced up and over our topographic barrier. And as they drop back down, we can see that the air must be drying because we're losing those clouds. Uh, and by the time it gets down to the surface, it is drier and warmer than it was when it passed over the mountains. So because of these processes, we can get things like this. These are called cap clouds or pileus clouds. Uh, these are stationary orographic clouds that form over the peak of a mountain when moist air is forced upwards uh, and over. So as it's forced up, uh, the windward slope condensation occurs as it flows over the top of the mountain. These form directly over uh, a mountain and have this kind of like typical dome shape that we're looking at here. So what you'll get is on the windward side, you'll have condensation on the leeward side, you'll have evaporation. It's kind of tough to see, but it gets a little wispier on that leeward side, those clouds do of this, this cap cloud here. So you can see we're losing some of that moisture to evaporation. We've also got another type we can see here. These are not cap clouds. We notice they're not directly over uh, or encompassing the mountain cap or the mountain peak. These are lenticular clouds. So lenticular clouds are characterized by a saucer-like shape. They form in the troposphere on the leeward side of a mountain, unlike cap clouds, which form over the peak. It forms on the crest of a wave that results from air forced to lift over the raised terrain. Its alignment is perpendicular to that of the direction of air movement. You can see a few more examples of that here. And here we can kind of see a diagram of what that looks like. So as that air is forced up and over that topographic barrier, you're getting these uh, clouds forming, these lenticular clouds forming on the leeward edge, uh, kind of downwind. My, <laughs> my, my uh, graphic won't play. There it is. <laughs> So you can see a couple more examples, kind of a fun fact. Uh, sometimes these lenticular clouds or cap clouds can be, uh, people will think they're, they're UFOs um, because I have such an interesting and, and kind of obtuse shape. Um, it's kind of a fun fact. We can see here, uh, kind of a better example is winds are rolling over. This is more of like a, a regional view. So as winds are rolling over those mountains, you're seeing kind of this, uh, the, these wave-like formations of these lenticular clouds uh, moving downwind or the leeward side of these mountains. Now moving into a different one, we've got this kind of wispy looking cloud here that forms uh, along these peaks here as well. These are not cap clouds, they're not lenticular clouds. These are what we call banner clouds. So this is basically a cloud plume that is often observed to extend downwind from these isolated, sharp, often pyramidal shaped mountain peaks, even on otherwise cloud free days. So these are kind of a more of a unique phenomena. Uh, we see them in places like the Alps, uh, the Himalaya, all these different kind of very sharp peaked mountain chains. Um, so another one to look at these banner clouds. And before we move on from orographic lifting, I alluded to Mount Doom before, or moisture in the atmosphere lab. That is our next random assignment. Uh, so make sure you go to Canvas to look for this one. Um, I have another slide here in just a minute. 
but you're going to be tracking a parcel of air as it moves up and over this mountain, which we lovingly refer to as Mount Doom. <laughs> um, I had to have a GIF in here because I'm a big Lord of the Rings nerd. But what you're basically going to be doing in this one, you're going to go to Canvas, you're going to download the uh, assignments, and there are two parts. There's part one and part two. Make sure you check Canvas for the due dates. Uh, I'm not having a due date listed on here just so that these slides can be used again in the future. Uh, part one is your required random assignment. You need to do part one and turn part one in. Part two is another uh, assignment, and it's a chance for you to earn some bonus points in the random assignment category if you need to get some more there. Uh, this one will be another example of you tracking this parcel of air moving up and over a mountain. Different example, different rates, different place. So go ahead and try those out and uh, we'll go ahead and move on here. So frontal lifting is the next mechanism, lifting mechanism that causes air to rise from the surface. So here we can see an example of this cold air mass moving towards this warm air mass. Let's see it moving here. If we think of it, if we recall, colder air is denser, warm air is less dense. So you get this air kind of being forced upwards. Notice these triangles here. This is what we would call a cold front. So on the meteorological maps, you'll see that triangular uh, hashed line we see here uh, denoting cold fronts. Their cousin, or they're akin to this, we have warmer, less dense air being forced over this wedge of colder, denser air. You'll get these warm fronts, and that is often denoted by this uh, line with kind of these half circles uh, lining or kind of uh, spaced along them. So warm fronts, uh, here's a graphic of a warm front that we can see. So the frontal zone slopes up and over this colder air mass ahead of it. That's kind of the primary mechanisms that we're seeing here. So this warm air rides along the front, up and over the cold air mass, cooling as it rises, producing clouds and precipitation in the advance of the surface warm front. Because the lifting is very gradual and steady, generally widespread and light intensity precipitation develops ahead of a warm front. Initially, a warm air mass nudges against a colder air mass ahead of it. The lighter, warm, moist air behind the front is lifted upward and overrides the colder air. So this is kind of getting more into the nitty gritty details of what's going on here. As that air rises, it cools. And if enough water vapor condenses, widespread cloud uh, formation and precipitation develops. A layer of thin clouds is occasionally observed more than a thousand kilometers in advance of a surface warm front. As the front gets closer, the clouds thicken and eventually light precipitation begins to fall. Because the frontal surface gently slopes up and over the cold air mass ahead of it, the upward motions associated with warm fronts are typically not as strong as the vigorous upward motions that you'll get ahead of a cold front. Now let's go ahead and look at why that is. So here's our cold front. So as the front advances, the cold air lifts the warmer air ahead of it. That's what we see those red arrows there. The air cools as it rises and the moisture condenses to produce clouds and precipitation ahead of and along the cold front. In contrast to the lifting along the warm front, upward motions along the cold front are typically, typically a lot more vigorous, producing deeper clouds and more intense bands of showers and thunderstorms. However, these bands are, quite, are typically quite narrow and move rapidly just ahead of the cold front. Diving into a little bit more of the nitty gritty here, Initially, the cold air mass and uh, wedges into the warmer air mass ahead of it, separated from each other by the cold front. The lighter warm air is lifted upwards by the denser cold air, and if enough water vapor condenses, clouds develop. If condensation of water vapor persists, precipitation may develop. Typically, in a narrow band just ahead of the cold front is where you'll see that precipitation occurring. Due to the steep slope of the cold front, so notice this is a very steep slope on this kind of leading edge of the cold front, vigorous rising motion is often produced, leading to the development of showers and occasionally to the development of severe thunderstorms.
Here you can see an example of just that. We point to this here, that is our cold front. So before I click ahead, notice that narrow thin band uh, and the leading edge of the front versus our warm front here, which is pushing towards the, uh, kind of towards the, the Northwest. Notice how extensive those clouds are on the leading portion of the warm front. Next, we've got horizontal convergence, and we've learned about this one before. Think back to our low pressure front here where winds are rushing towards the center, uh, driven by things like the Coriolis effect, friction force, drag forces on the surface. We kind of get this uh, cyclonic motion occurring. This horizontal convergence forces air upwards, diverging in the upper atmosphere. You get uh, rising air masses and cooling air cond uh, condensation and cloud formation because of it. We typically see this expressed in things like hurricanes, tropical cyclones, uh, mid-latitude cyclones. We're not going to focus on that too much here. We're just going to accept that horizontal convergence occurs because in future videos, uh, we're going to really dive into hurricanes and mid-latitude cyclones a little bit more. And last, we have our localized or free convection. Which we can see here so you've got the sun heating this body of water as it does so you have this rising thermal energy coming off that body of water leading to a buoyant air parcel and once it rises and cools enough to the lifting condensation level you have condensation occurring and mass and cloud development starting as well now we typically see that like this, we see these types of clouds forming as a result of localized or free convection. These are cumulus clouds. We're gonna be learning a lot more about them in the next video. Here we can see uh, along the coast of Florida, the development of these bigger cumulus clouds here, these kind of pockets of cloud formation that you're seeing developing across the surface. So, it's important to note that these often act in combination. It's not any one single occurrence or any one single mechanism that's happening. There are a lot of things going on that can drive how these mechanisms lead to rising air parcels. And as you have rising air parcels, you have cooling air. Atmospheric stability and cloud development are definitely important here. So atmospheric stability just refers to the condition of the atmosphere that determines whether air will rise spontaneously or not. Lifting mechanisms like orographic lifting, frontal lifting, and horizontal convergence are what we would call forced lifting. That's different than localized free convection, which we would call spontaneous lifting. These are two different types of lifting. One is being forced by something in the topography or atmosphere. The other is occurring more spontaneously as a result of localized uh, conditions. So atmospheric stability determines whether clouds like these, these cumulus clouds that we're looking at here, will develop into something like this, this monster cumulus cloud here that would uh, definitely full of precipitation and pretty big thunderstorm likely. So there are a few different stability classes that we'll talk about here. So you've got absolutely stable, absolutely unstable, and conditionally unstable. So the actual stability of an air parcel is determined by the orientation of the environmental lapse rate in comparison with either the dry or the moist adiabatic lapse rates. So the environmental lapse rate, we haven't really talked about that. It's just exactly what it sounds like. It's the rate of change of the temperature of the environment with changing altitude. We often think of these uh, air parcels, as we've talked about, as discrete parcels of air. This is its own parcel of air, right? Unnamed 3M tape. Um, everything around it is the environment. So as the environment changes, it's not affecting this parcel of air by changing what's going on within the parcel. The parcel is its own thing, but the environment changes and that changes how that parcel of air moves through the atmosphere. And that's the next important part we're gonna talk about. So it's important to realize that because the atmosphere on average is not rising or sinking, 
the environmental lapse rate is going to look a lot different than the dry or the moist adiabatic lapse rate. In fact, it is those differences that allow us to determine whether a particular part of the atmosphere is stable or unstable. In this figure, we see the dry and the moist adiabatic lapse rates as those dashed lines, and we see the three different regions for absolutely unstable, conditionally unstable, and absolutely stable. That's referencing uh, the temperature on the horizontal axis and altitude on the vertical axis. So first we're going to look at absolutely unstable. Advance this because I didn't mean to have those. Uh, the atmosphere is considered to be unstable if a rising parcel of air cools more slowly than the environmental lapse rate. This causes the air parcel to remain warmer and less dense than its surroundings and therefore continue to accelerate upwards. The orientation of an unstable environmental lapse rate can be seen in this figure. Moving into absolutely stable, the atmosphere is excuse me, considered to be stable if the rising parcel cools faster than the environmental lapse rate. This causes the air parcel to become cooler and more dense than its surroundings, and therefore it's going to lose some of that buoyancy that it has. Vertical motions tend to be restricted when the atmosphere is in a stable equilibrium. The orientation of a stable environmental lapse rate can be seen here off to the right side of the moist adiabatic lapse rate. And then finally, we get to conditional instability. And that just says that an unsaturated parcel of air will be cooler uh, than the environment and will sink back to the ground while a saturated parcel of air will be warmer than the environment and will continue to ascend. So let's go ahead and look at what that looks like in uh, a graphical form here. So we have our parcel of air. The parcel of air is uh, holding a temperature of about 30 degrees Celsius. The dew point is about 22 degrees Celsius. The environmental lapse rate or ELR in this example or right now is gonna equal 0.4 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters of rise. So at the surface or in this example, we're also at 30 degrees Celsius. So the air temperature of the parcel and the air temperature uh, in the surrounding air are the same. Once you get to 1,000 meters, if you look at that 0.4 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters, you're going to lose 4 degrees. Once you get to 2,000, another 4 degrees. And once you get to 3,000, you get another 4 degrees all the way down to 18 degrees Celsius. So it's lost 12 degrees Celsius in those 3,000 meters. Uh, it's risen in the atmosphere. That air parcel is going to change a bit differently. So if you're doing this at home, go ahead and calculate uh, what the dry adiabatic lapse rate or one degree Celsius for every 100 meters would get you going from 30 degrees up to 1,000 meters. Uh, do the same for the dew point as well, if you would like to practice. So we get 20 degrees Celsius uh, is our air parcel temperature once we get to that point. Dew point, be 20 degrees Celsius as well at this point. Remember that 0.2 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters. We've gone 1,000 meters, so 2 degrees Celsius drop in our dew point. That is our lifting condensation level, or our LCL. Dew point is equal to air temperature. At our saturated adiabatic lapse rate, we're going to be uh, using that for the remainder here. In this example, 0.5 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters of rise. Once we get to 2,000, we drop to 15 degrees Celsius. Once we get to 3,000, we drop to 10 degrees Celsius. So that's the air parcel and the dew point as well. So both are dropping at that consistent rate. This is what we refer to as absolute stability or absolutely stable air parcel. Here, the air temperature is changing at a rate uh, faster than that of the environmental lapse rate. So the saturated is greater than the environmental lapse rate. Here, in our next example, all conditions at the start remain the same. Our, env our environmental lapse rate is going to be 1.2 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters, so drastically different than the last example. So that means that by the time we get to that 3,000 meters, we're going to be down to negative 6 degrees Celsius. Our air parcel, there's our lifting condensation level again. This is changing at the same rate. By the time we get up here, 15 degrees by the time we get to the top, 10 degrees Celsius. So here we have absolutely unstable air. And then in our last example, starting conditions held the same. 
The environmental lapse rate is going to change at a rate of 0.75 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters. There's our LCL moving upwards. Here we have conditionally unstable air. And I should point out that here, this is our level of free convection. This is where the air parcel has the same rate as the environmental temperature as it, they're both changing, moving up in the atmosphere. So what determines the stability of air class or of a uh, air parcel in the atmosphere? Well, the environmental lapse rate, saturated adiabatic lapse rate. So here, in this case, the absolutely stable case, if the environmental lapse rate is less than that of the saturated adiabatic lapse rate, or the environmental lapse rate is less than that of the dry adiabatic lapse rate, we have an absolutely stable air parcel, or atmosphere, pardon me. Here, if the environmental lapse rate is greater than the dry adiabatic lapse rate, or greater than the saturated adiabatic lapse rate, we have an absolutely unstable atmosphere. And then over here, the environmental lapse rate is less than that of the dry adiabatic lapse rate, but greater than that of the saturated adiabatic lapse rate, we have conditionally unstable atmosphere. So that can change as well. So our environmental lapse rate can change as well. So what determines how high unstable air will rise? Well, here we start out at 1.2 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters, but Further up in the atmosphere, it might be 0.3 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters. There, we change that up to being 15 degrees Celsius. That's our uh, equilibrium level. That is where we're getting kind of this cloud formation occurring and kind of capping, if you will. So if we change those up a little bit, so now, we kind of have an inversion point here. So, right, we've got uh, almost a temperature inversion. So our environmental lapse rate is increasing um, as the air parcel rises or as it is rising in the atmosphere to you know, negative three degrees Celsius for every 100 meters versus we're cooling uh, that 1.2 degrees Celsius. So we're changing that up here. There are air parcel or our environmental uh, temperatures are warming. Our equilibrium level drops. And you can see that here, these kind of uh, what we would call cumulus humilis clouds, uh, kind of denoting kind of that lower and capped uh, equilibrium level here. So what about clouds like these? These are what we would call cumulonimbus clouds or anvil clouds. So they kind of form, and as they form, you can kind of see a, a almost like a plateau point on the top, right? Giving it that characteristic and distinct anvil shape. And you can see that here as well. So they kind of serve as showing kind of where that maximum point of development can occur. Uh, so they kind of encapsulate the lifting condensation level all the way up to that uh, stability point in the atmosphere. So after that, kind of your cloud formation is not sustainable. Um, based off of kind of the top of that plateau. So atmospheric stability and the environmental lapse rate. The environmental lapse rate largely determines the stability class of the atmosphere. What affects the environmental lapse rate? Well, surface heating and cooling is one of them. Let's look at a couple of profiles uh, of vertical temperature now. So here we can see uh, kind of just an average uh, change of temperature with altitude. Here we assume that our environmental lapse rate is 0.65 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters. So this maybe is at sunrise. At noon, it changes, right? We're heating different portions of our atmosphere differently. We think of the land masses that are being heated at zero or at the surface. They're gonna affect that vertical temperature profile pretty drastically. So maybe our environmental lapse rate is 5.65 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters until you get to about 200 meters or so, while it remains the same as you go further up in the atmosphere. 
by mid afternoon, maybe it's even steeper, right? The environmental lapse rate is 4.94 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters while it remains the same in the upper portions of the atmosphere. And now it's extended vertically uh, to maybe about, oh, I don't know, 275 meters up is where you see that uh, kink point there. And this is kind of how you get the development of these big billowy clouds in our summertime, right? So as the environmental lapse rates change, uh, you have kind of these changing rates of uh, buoyancy of these air parcels in the atmosphere. And as you do, as they rise and condense, you'll get these kind of beautiful cumulus clouds developing, especially in our, in our summer times, uh, summertime months. Now, if we go into a colder portion of our, or, uh, of our year, look here, now our temperatures are uh, between negative 25 and zero degrees Celsius. So this would be for winter. Maybe this is what it looks like at sunset. Again, environmental lapse rate is 0.65 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters in this example. But at midnight, it's got this kink here. So still 0.65 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters, but down here, negative 7.35 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters by midnight. Here it steepens out a little bit during our sunrise or that uh, environmental lapse rate is now going to be negative 4.02 degrees Celsius for every 100 meters. I mean, kind of see that here, this uh, smoke being emitted here uh, in the Arctic actually is being capped because of that thermal inversion that you see with the environmental lapse rate and how it's kind of keeping those air parcels kind of contained rather than allowing them to rise and move throughout the atmosphere. Warm and cold air advection is another one. We looked at these examples of our frontal systems before. I see this moving into San Francisco, kind of these air masses moving throughout uh, where they get to, where they stop. Synoptic scale subsidence. So subsidence refers to the extensive sinking motion of air, most frequently occurring in anticyclones. Subsiding air is warmed by compression and becomes more stable. We look at this example here. This uh, can lead to subsidence inversion is what we'll call it. So you have uh, kind of this maybe super cooled air up here. So negative 39 degrees Celsius all up to negative 45 degrees Celsius. And this inversion point You can see, once we advance this here, just a hair. There we go. Uh, <laughs> so as you have that sinking air parcel, uh, you generally have kind of this in subsidence inversion is what we would call it. And this is typically associated with these high pressure systems. So what can this can kind of serve to cap uh, movement and uh, distribution of these air parcels throughout the atmosphere. Here we can kind of see, again, as move, air moves up and over in this example, it's kind of changing as it's forced over this mountain. You can kind of see that again from the other side here as well. This kind of orographic example is a good example of what we're talking about with this uh, inversion point. Here, if we look at the Atacama uh, in Chile, kind of see this type of formation occurring as well. So in this video, we talked about lifting air parcels, frontal systems, and atmospheric stability. In the next videos, we're gonna be talking about uh, major types of cloud formation and precipitation as well. In the future, we'll be talking about uh, mid-latitude cyclones and hurricanes before we dive into uh, a little bit more of the paleo climate side of the world. So uh, hope you enjoyed the video. And if you have any questions, go ahead and let me know, but I will see you in the next video and hope you have a great day. Thank you.